get to our closing keynote. Yippee! We are so excited. It's we're making it through this this week and getting things done, and that's really awesome. I'm so excited for us to be here. Uh, and welcome to our awesome team from uh, World Savvy, and they have a whole bunch of them who are presenting here. I see Dana shaking her head, so she's probably going to open this for us. Uh, I don't think you need any of those beginning slides anymore. They disappeared anyway, uh, but we don't need them. I think we've all been here long enough to know what's happening. So thank you for being here. And uh, if you have anything you want put into the public chat, just put it in the private chat and I will share it with the public. Good job, everybody. Have fun. Thanks, Jolene, so much. And, and hello, everybody. I uh, probably saw a number of you yesterday morning for the opening keynote and I know it's been an amazing few days, a um, couple of days of learning um, with the world. We've got so many countries represented in the Glow Conference this year. Um, hi, Emily Show um, from California and a bunch of states and just folks coming in from all over the country. So really appreciate you and I'm honored to wrap our time together. There's a global competence meetup after this and an after party as well, a virtual after party. But what KK and Cindy um, and myself are going to do is just try to put a bookend on two days of pretty amazing conversation around how to really think about the substantive integration of global competence into teaching and learning and culture within K-12 and higher ed. I know we've got a, an audience from higher ed here too. So I'll introduce myself for those of you who didn't get to spend um, time uh, uh, with me yesterday morning, and then we'll invite my colleague KK and our and our colleague Cindy to, to introduce herself. Um, if you looked at the program, we're missing a couple of folks. Thanksgiving week, family in town, school letting out, had some medical emergencies. Friday's here. Um, excellent. Um, and so um, we are really, really grateful that Fade, who's um, our longtime friend and collaborator from Newark, uh, New Jersey, is chiming in on the conversation. So um, my name is Dana Mortensen. I'm the co-founder and CEO of World Savvy. We're a national education nonprofit, a premier sponsor of the Glow, Glow Conference. We've been doing this work uh, for 21 years um, across 45 states, 32 countries, um, and have reached more than 800,000 students and 7,000 educators. And we are collectively building a network of 10,000 schools across the US that center global competence in teaching, learning, and culture, um, and have done that in partnership with the two folks that are joining us here from our network. Um, so I'll pass the mic to KK to introduce yourself, and then um, Cindy and Fade would welcome you to do the same, and please, Spare no uh, detail, and I would love for this audience to have a bit more of the in-depth introduction about um, your experience and your background and what your roles um, call you to do now. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm KK Nyman. I am the Director of Professional Learning at World Savvy. I have been in education now for, I guess, over 20 years, and I've been, you know, I'm not sure if we've talked about this, but World Savvy has been around for 20 years. So as an educator who was coming into teaching right when World Savvy was first coming on the scene, I've really gotten to benefit from all of the resources and support I've received from them over the years. And so I have spent most of my career teaching social studies and English, uh, really everything from fifth to 12th grade. So I've um, I have a lot of experience in various age ranges, but I did just step out of the classroom after 10 years teaching sixth grade humanities. So where I really spent 10 years thinking about what it means to teach for global competence and how the matrix can live in my teaching practice, in my classroom, in my grade book, and in my conversations with students and families. So I stepped into this role just about a year and a half ago, and it's been wonderful now to get to talk to schools and districts and support them in their efforts to do, you know, what I've been trying for 10 years with the support of World Savvy. So it's great to be here. So uh, I'll go next. I'm Cindy Durain. I'm the associate principal at Norwood High School. Um, this is my 31st year in education, and I began um, as a Spanish teacher and then a world language department chair, uh, and now um, assistant principal, then associate principal. So um, I feel like in each of my roles, I've had a different impact on our students and on our building and in our ability to widen the circle of our students that have used World Savvy. So. Um, in 2013, I began drawing from World Savvy's 
um, resources to work with our global citizenship program um, and launch that with a small number of students who were looking to make a global impact um, and pursue a like extra diploma of you know certifying them that they were uh, global citizens. Um, it had called for them to take action on a project. So World Savvy's approach to global competence and being hands-on was fantastic in getting us launched. Um, slowly over time that, you know, as my role switched, we were able to um, use that program as an e exemplar and World Savvy's uh, continued support and resources to make this really district-wide. Um, which has been a, a, an awesome experience. So we're really happy that um, we have a lot of a, a, a cohort of high school teachers who are using the World Savvy curriculum case studies and approach um, in their classrooms. And our middle school um, principal has has really led the initiative at that level to um, get the the teams at each grade level to do project-based learning using World Savvy's case studies um, throughout the building. It's awesome. And we're hoping this summer to launch a bridge program to help transition kids from grade eight to grade nine to build their skills using World Savvy's resources as well. Hello, everyone. Hello. And thank you for sharing your story, Cindy, KK, and Dana. And Dana, thank you so much. Uh, for inviting me. I am always super blessed to be in a space with educators, uh, people who care about children and the future, and that's actually why I got into teaching. Uh, my name is Fade. Uh, I work as Director of Curriculum Instruction at Great Oaks Legacy Charter School, a uh, wonderful school, downtown middle school in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And uh, part of my educational journey has been a lot of, I guess, I want to say broken dreams, right? So I, I got into education because i literally, quite frankly, wanted to change the world, right? I went into uh, Newark, New Jersey, and that was one of the schools that I was placed in. And I really just dreamed of helping students really find themselves, find their passions and learn. But the context in which I got to education was more about standards, based teaching, uh, making sure students got these specific skills to be able to then go to the next grade to get more skills. Uh, and it kind of sucked away the life of teaching for me. Um, and so I kind of went searching at different schools, may, maybe thinking that one school wasn't the right place for me and going to a different one. Um, but then what I ended up learning when I actually ran into uh, Dana and then became a student of World Savvy is that you don't really have to go to a different school, but if you have the right mindset, the right concepts, the right ways of thinking, teaching becomes something different. You can take control, master standards, put it a little bit to the side. Sorry for the folks who really love standards. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, though. <laughs> uh, put the standards a little bit to the side, but honestly, go back to why we then thus educate our young people, right? We educate them so that they can go into the communities, go into their communities and do something that Goldie Muhammad say, which is they want, want them to disrupt, want them to dismantle the way that the inequalities exist within our world so they can make the world a better set place for themselves, right? And for others. That's why I got into teaching. So I got into education. Uh, and then I was blessed enough to be uh, actually run into uh, someone who took a chance on me and wanted me to be a teacher leader, a uh, teacher coach uh, at a school called East Harlem Scholars Academy. And uh, that woman was a mentor to me, a coach to me. And she taught me that you can also spread that love and joy, the idea that teaching is magic it's beyond just uh, the standards and the skills and the bubble sheets that we want our kids to just kind of do and be able to create, create beautiful things together, right? Um, one of the products that came out of World Savvy was that our students did an entire world fair. They designed it from scratch to finish. Uh, they made uh, presentations, plays, shows. They made cultural foods. They interviewed people and displayed the interview. They invited their family. It was a huge celebration uh, that, our, that my students were able to do. And they did that because I told them that all this knowledge that they have, it's within them. It's also on the internet, right? And we're all gonna work together to find out what it is that we wanna create and create a beautiful experience where we learn to honor other people's cultures. But first we have to teach them how to honor themselves, right? And that's kind of where the global citizens mindset goes into teaching the concept, the framework is that we're trying to help our students learn who they are, build in them leadership, co-create, work together, their values, their identities, and follow these behaviors, right? These behaviors that make these people who we send out into the world, these young people that we send out into the world to make the world, like I said earlier, a much, much better place. 
I love that. Um, thank you, Fade and Cindy, for being with us. And also just Fade for this reminder of like, there's some comments um, racking up about this, but I've never met an educator in you know a few decades of of the of the work that you know got into teaching for like I love tests. Yeah. It's my favorite thing. Mm -hmm. So just just as a reminder around how much this kind of framing on teaching and learning sparks the initial passion and interest and love of why most people go in the profession to connect with kids and to help them thrive is just so important. Um, so I've gotten the privilege of seeing some of your students in action in both contexts and just what that looks like, what it does for young people. And I wonder if Fadi and Cindy and KK, since you did this for so many years in the classroom as well, what, what does it actually look like when students are engaged in this kind of learning? Well, how do you see changes in their dispositions and attitudes, not just about the world, but about school and learning itself potentially, and maybe some examples that might um, be in your back pocket as some favorites would be great to share with the group. Um, I think my my favorite one was one I shared in June. So I hope I, uh, I'm i not going to, um, for people who maybe were with us in June, I don't want to uh, totally be stale, but mm -hmm. I think one, you know, one of our things is, is, is for teachers, the process can be really uncomfortable because you have to, um, the learning is messy and not necessary, not necessarily linear, right? When you let kids take responsibility for their own learning, um, there's a lot of growth that has to happen and a lot of trust that has to be built on both sides. So um, that's, teachers are used to being in control in a lot of situations. And, and to Fade's point about the standards, it's really hard to be able, like we're really lucky that our um, assistant, uh, assistant superintendent, when we took on this, this work with World Savvy said, I don't care about your scores. Right. Like that was like that was a powerful moment for our teachers. Um, but the truth of the matter is, and over time we've proven this, is that the scores will rise as a result of giving kids control over their learning because their engagement just grows and grows and grows. Right. And they're you're empowering them every step along the way. So my favorite um, story uh, or to share about this learning is a student who really was really um moved about uh, experience that she had with a, a, a dear friend of hers who lost a limb early on. And it was hard for his family to um, pay every time he needed a prosthesis, you know, as, as, as he would grow and shift, things had to, had to happen for him. And it was really, really difficult. And she started with this lens about people around the world and all of the different circumstances that people find them in and how um, we're lucky here that in the States that people will help or, you know, there's um, GoFundMe and things like that, that, that families can take advantage of. And in other countries, they're not as fortunate. So she really started with this lens of how can we put pros prosthetics and make prosthetics available to people in countries that where they're where they aren't so available. And what she found was like barrier after barrier after barrier. Every time she thought she was onto something, she was off. We at first she started with the idea that we would collect prosthetics. Um, from people who didn't need them anymore and keep them one out of the landfill. So that was that, you know, connected to uh, environmental um, SDGs and uh, as well as like inequality, removing barriers to things. And, and she um, was devastated when she learned that you can't donate prosthetics because it won't fit right and it will cause other issues. So she um, was like, okay, well, we'll 3D print them. And then that became, you know, at the time that she was doing this, 3D printers were just kind of making their way into school. And our school had this really tiny one. Um, and so she, we put her with different colleges and no one could really take on. And by the deadline that we had to have all of the projects submitted for her to earn her certificate of global competence um, as a senior and, and celebrate her at graduation, she didn't have anything um, completed in the traditional sense, right? But we were like, there is a celebration in all of the things that you did. And, and to say that you failed isn't um, 
you know, isn't something that we were comfortable um, saying and putting that label on that. And then we just kind of had this whole conversation as a as a group of administrators who were judging these projects and ultimately issuing that stamp of global citizenship on our kids that like failing is the most essential piece of learning. So um, so let's go, let's celebrate that. And um, she was able to share in, in, in all of the things and all of the trials and errors and, and ultimately, um, what she learned in the process was far more valuable than any final product, you know? So that is my, I think my favorite story. Absolutely. And also just an introduction to the complexity of, you know, how, how so many of these issues are not sort of easy to tackle and they involve so many different steps. What a, an amazing experience. Um, Keke and Fadi, happy to have you contribute whatever's on your mind. You can go first, Fadi, if you want. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. Um, so uh, for me, I, I'll i give the story of a perspective of what it looks like for a teacher to engage in the process of being able to even uh, push their students to be there. And then an administrator who really wants to take a chance on, uh, administrator who really wants to take chances, right, to take some risks. Um, I think that when we oftentimes think of uh, global competence or anything that requires, as Cindy was saying, to allow teachers more liberty to create, uh, to be artists in, in a way. Uh, we also have to understand that a lot of what we're asking them to do, and I think someone said in the chat, it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of work to design the process and to even build the mindset and the framework to think about how you can make it happen. It means that you have to let go, right? It means that you have to be more of a facilitator in the classroom. Yeah, you got to give some like understandings and some you know knowledge uh, here and there just to present to the students, so they kind of think about and think through problems. But you got to be able to present it right to them. What I am proud of is my teachers who are my teachers who do not give up and they relent every single day to make sure that school doesn't feel like a very limiting space to be when it comes to learning and education. Mm -hmm. So that when I said and presented to them after coaching them for about three years, I said and presented them and said, hey, listen, I want us to do some passion projects. We're gonna create this space. Your kids get to do passion projects. I didn't give them a specific directive. They just said, well, when you say passion projects, what do you mean? Kids should explore what they love, what they want to explore, what they love, figure out what it is that the, the kids also want to know, what they want to love, what they, because I had a student who actually uh, presented the other day and she, for the past two months, could not for the life of her find out what she was passionate in. But as soon as she figured out what she was passionate in, she ended up giving an entire presentation to the entire class. The kids were calling her president. Uh, they were celebrating her with love. Um, I have another story of a student who used his community of discord and social media uh, to learn more about coding. And he was coding art and video games in class. And he was given the space to do that. And the teachers gave the process of how you could look for the discovery. But before the teachers could do that, it was a lot of conversations before uh, with them about how we get away from this idea where the standards, uh, which are, as someone said, we as humans are not standard, right? And so because of that, we have to know our individual learners, right? We have to know who they are. And at the same time, as an educator, you have to think about how do you even want to release this box that you or get out of the box that you've been placed in? And so it took a lot of unlearning. But I think that what geared everyone together into taking a risk with me to learn how to teach differently, to learn how to empower students, to give them that space to collaborate and create knowledge together. Like it's not the guy, it's not the stage on the stage, the guide on the side, right? Um, what did that for the teachers was us grounding our work in two big texts. One, and I always suggest these texts to any educator, A Cultivating Genius, uh, which talks about, uh, by Goldie Muhammad, which talks about this framework. It's very aligned with World Savvy's a framework of global competency, which allows you to think about how are we co-creating, how are we uh, building our global citizens, how are we building our students to be able to use this knowledge for some sort of action in the future. And then Zaretta Hammond's Culture Responsive Teaching of the Brain, right, which is about how do we leverage community, uh, how do we leverage identities, and how do we do that all to help students learn? How do we create learning from that space? Because at the end of the day, we're if we work in education, we are in charge of students learning to be better people, right? And so global competency, if you go into a classroom and you see learning happening, it looks messy. It's not gonna be a teacher talking for a very structured here at this time, do group work, do independent work. It's something different. It's flexible. It looks like art. You see magic happening. You see kids sharing ideas and teachers 
on the on the switch, changing their entire lesson to go with that student's thought, right? Um, I'll close with this. Uh, I actually uh, had to step step in and substitute for one of my teachers, who is an amazing teacher. He led a negotiations class, and the kids never had done it before. And the kids were learning how to negotiate real time on trade agreements. Seventh graders, by the way, seventh yes. graders and eighth graders. Um, and now when I see kids and they want something, I say, "Well, remember what we learned in class to negotiate." Uh, so we spent some time um, together, and um, I had asked him. I said, "Have y'all do y'all experience current events in any sort of way?" Uh, and they said, um, maybe I watch all the news. Like, do you share about it with your friends? And they said, not really. I said, what I want you all to do is, I want you to use these couple of resources. I want you to explore some current events. And at first they were like, I don't want to read some current events. And then afterwards they were raising their hands to share about what they had just learned, right? Having conversations with kids. And the funny thing is when you think about standards, like main ideas and topics, kids would ask questions like, was that what the whole point of the article was? Because when I read the article, I got something different, right? And then they started sharing their ideas with one another. One kid said, Mr. Dick, right, can we bring in some like robotic stuff into the classroom after reading about all this stuff around engineering for students? Like I, they learned that and they wanted to bring that back into their space. You got to give kids the time to do that. You got to craft lessons and instruction with the time to do that. It's hard work, but yo, it's good work. It's good work. And it yields so much more than teaching them. And no offense to my, my math books. I know y'all love math, but algebra two eventually wanes away when you become about 25 or 26. Not saying it's not important, it just kind of wades away. But what's more important is the ability to collaborate with one another, ability to love on one another, to love others, to build community with one another, and to just use whatever it is that you learn within your heart and your soul, the passion to kind of change the world. I'll talk a lot about changing the world. It's like, I know it's a, it's a, it's a time. Yes, change right? the world, but listen, listen. We got, we got an amen, Fade, in the, uh, in the comments. So I think that, I think that, that sums up. And I also love, Yesterday I was talking about um, moving from the sage on the stage to the meddler in the middle, but I also love the guide on the side. Um, mm -hmm. it's a really great way of framing that so that teachers aren't making themselves central to the learning process, but allowing for this messy and flexible thing to emerge that's completely engagement based. The other thing, Kika, I wanna hear from you too is well, a little curveball for a minute because you really, the books, the text you recommended, it's an important thread that we've been thinking a lot about at World Savvy. We don't think of global competence in teaching and learning as something, um, you know, competitive or other than, you know, equity work or social emotional learning work or STEAM and STEM. It is a framework to think about an inclusive and equitable future ready learning model that can be applied and integrated in lots of different environments. And one of the things you got me thinking about in thinking about how to leverage diverse identities as a strength, um, and that's what you're describing. That's what you're doing in your classrooms. And that's the container you're providing for your, your teachers is we're talking so much in the U.S. This may also be true globally. The stats I know better are here in the U.S. about the fact that we have a collective majority in classrooms. A majority of students identify as black, indigenous people of color in our K-12 classrooms. And the vast majority of educators, 75 plus percent, look mm -hmm. like me, right? They're white women predominantly. And we spend a lot of time trying to diversify the educator pipeline, welcome teachers of color so that young people are growing up with examples of, you know, people who, who look like them and share lived experience. But we don't talk a lot about once you're in that environment, how do you honor and leverage and see those identities as part of the strength of teaching? So, so the stat, and KK helped me out because we've been looking at these and working with them a lot. Teach, <clears throat> teachers in general have been leaving the classrooms in droves. I mean, any K-12 mm -hmm. educator in the U.S. knows that's true. But but the percentage of teachers of color who are leaving the classroom is dramatically higher. And yeah. what we've talked with BIPOC educators in our network about is it's not just about identifying people who come into that classroom, but how do you build a community that honors who they are and what they bring at the very core of learning? And I, I just, I love the text that you introduced um, because that to me is, that is so, so important um, to, to ensure that diversity is honored and it's not a checkbox. It's not something that someone wants for a statistic to, you know, to, to sort of share, you know, the, to share out um, as a win. So I just, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And both of those texts are really phenomenal for those in the comments. Um, happy to have anybody comment on that, but also KK would welcome, welcome your thoughts too. Well, I can kind of, I'll take a little bit about I'll just sort of build on what you were saying, because I can just say for me, too, as a teacher, like when you think about people leaving the profession, um, 
when you center a global competence, it gives teachers a new vision for what teaching can be. And I actually think that's what teachers need now. Um, to Fade's point, like who gets excited about standards and test scores? And if that becomes if that becomes the center of why you're in the classroom, or if it feels like that's why you're in the classroom, people aren't going to stay there. So I really found for me that when global competence became the center of what I was doing in my classroom, it allowed me to weather a lot of storms that happen within a school, within a district, because I had this purpose. And it gave me focus, not just so like when I had the global competence matrix, it helped me design the learning experiences that I was going to give to students. It helped me design the grade book in the way that I was going to assess. It framed conversations that I had with students and with families. And so when a school, like then when someone's like, we have this new thing that we're doing, then I could say, how does that fit into my vision? And I would just make it fit. And usually it does, because if someone says, you know, I was lucky enough to work at a school that did a lot of work around race and equity. And because I had already centered global competence, and then we start doing that work, I'm like, this fits perfectly. I'm doing that. And I can build and grow in this space because I already have this framework that allows me to think about that. I will say too, just hearkening back, Dana, to your question about what the student experience is, is, you know, we do talk a lot about in schools, we talk about sort of classroom management. There's been a lot of talk about that, especially coming out of the pandemic with folks saying that kids don't know how to be in a classroom and they're seeing, you know, quote, bad behaviors or unwanted disruptive behaviors. And then we're also seeing this spike in you know, concerns over the social emotional state of students seeing high rates of depression and anxiety. And what I find so fascinating about all of this is that we ha are having these conversations separate of what, separate of examining what we're asking kids to do when they come into school for seven and a half hours every day. Um, it's no wonder kids are being disruptive if they're in a classroom where their identities are not valued, where the content they're covering are feeling separate and disconnected from their lives, when they do not get to voice the things that they care about, when they do not get to connect with others. And it's no wonder they feel depressed and anxious when school feels like a box they have to check. So, and they spend a good portion of their time there. And I just think these conversations can't happen in siloed ways that we have to look at all of that data and ask ourselves, how do we make school a place where important work is happening and where kids come and feel inspired and they're allowed to be curious and they are allowed to think critically and creatively about the world that they are not only occupying in this moment, but that they get to think and shape the world that they are going to occupy. And one of the things I used to notice, you know, coming out of teaching sixth grade, but, you know, I'd go to my sixth grade team meetings and I'd have other teachers say, so I'm seeing this, so-and-so struggling here, so-and-so struggling there, or I can't get them to sit down or, you know, talking about all these disruptive behaviors. And I would think quietly because teachers don't appreciate when you say this out loud, but to myself, I was like, I don't see any of that mm -hmm. because in my space, that kid's a high flyer. They're like engaging, they're asking questions, they're articulating ideas and opinions. And I do think there is like, there's so many things that shift in a room when you center this kind of teaching that you don't even realize are going to happen for students. And I think that that is, um, that's a really powerful tool to really think about, like, if I'm going to center this and value this, there's so many ways that it ripples out in a classroom and in a school community. Um, and so then when you imagine a school doing it on a whole and not just pockets of teachers, you can really see how a school will transform itself. And the teachers start to expect something from themselves that's different. And frankly, the students and families start to expect something else. Because once they experience what learning can be, when they go to the next grade, they're going to say, I don't, what's happening here? Like, 
this isn't what learning should be like. And I do think that's how you start to create kind of that groundswell of change. I love it. Amen to that, to all of that. Um, in the time we have left, we're going to end on a high note, but I do feel like we'd be remiss if we don't talk a little bit about Fade and Cindy. Um, you know, I think of you both as just these amazing advocates and evangelists almost for this work, right? Like, you know, I think, you know, I think back to even the very first days I met you and, you know, in my mind, you know, anybody who's standing still long enough to hear about the importance of this work is going to hear it from the two of you, right? And at the same time, there are challenges, right, to shift a mindset, a more traditional mindset around teaching and learning and get people to sort of open up. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't add a nod to what's happening in the U.S. right now for the global participants. We're sort of navigating this unprecedented politicization and, and battleground within the K-12 space at a time when students should have their perspectives broadened, right? And for a complex and interconnected world, there's a lot of efforts to narrow them. We had more than 1,600 uh, books uh, threatened with a band last year, which is more than the 20 years prior. And those are mostly about themes of racial diversity and, L and LGBTQ identity. Um, we've had 238 pieces of legislation introduced to limit the rights of LGBTQ youth inside K-12 schools across the country in 36 states that have introduced some type of anti-divisive concept slash um, you know, uh, anti-CRT work, right? Literally the inability to tell the truth about our country's history and have open conversations. So there are certainly forces at work, um, maybe for many of the educators who are in this room that are trying to narrow those perspectives and, and do the opposite of what you're all describing. And that's kind of at the, at the, at the higher level. I'm curious, both whether it's at that higher level, the kind of conversations, I know you're in Massachusetts and New Jersey, um, there are some states that um, are certainly, you know, struggling quite a bit more um, than yours with respect to this narrowing. I, you know, I would love to hear from you sort of what are those challenges, both big and small? And and what have you developed over the years to sort of navigate or advocate or, or help people get over some of the barriers that are, you know, um, to be expected when you're trying to change hearts and minds about something like this? Um, I think we're super fortunate to be in Massachusetts um, and also in Norwood over the last year where uh, we've taken on um, a whole self-reflective equity audit. So I think for us, we're at the point now where we are recognizing places and spaces in our school system as a whole where we need to do a better job in terms of curriculum in terms of safe spaces for kids, it, like really systemically policies and all. So I think we're actually at a place where we're doing the opposite of what you're talking about, um, which feels really good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I, I think location is everything when it comes to this, and and um, there isn't, we started this, we started our work with World Savvy as a district after we went to Panama, Dana, and, and uh, we're working on global competence with educators from other places around Massachusetts, right? So um, we've been doing this with World Savvy or planning this work as a district with World Savvy since 2019. And every time um, the budget comes up, it hasn't been an option to eliminate World Savvy, which... You know what I mean? I think I think says a lot about the district's commitment to 100%. to this work. Um, you know, and and I think I don't know. That just kind of warms my heart. I wouldn't uh, I, you know. not interrupt Sydney, but to give yourself credit that you yes. all did deep implementation in COVID. <laughs> you all were launching some very big initiatives, and so if that can be done, like anything's possible right yeah and i think and i think you know we, we're this year we're using it as like kind of a reset because some of our work has been fragmented as a result of the pandemic but i think one of the things that has inspired um and i'll share this is another student story so i'm not sure that it's completely related to the question but it's a nice story and and it has also kind of um been a uh a motivating factor for a lot of our faculty, but we have a student 
um, who is in a social emotional classroom. Um, she is included in a lot of the spaces around our building and, and takes her classes, um, uh, you know, is able to, to go to all, many of her classes, but she has some real tough days and um, gets a lot of social emotional support. And in the past, um, I feel like these kids, kids like her faced a lot of judgment and a lot of failure. We have a class at our school called World Savvy, and the whole purpose of it is for kids to, as Fade said, pursue a passion project of their own. Um, and what she did last year, she used her experience in her um, classroom where kids have trouble sometimes managing their emotions and they slam the door on their way out of the classroom or something like that. Um, and in some, some of the classrooms around her, that classroom, she was also noting, noticing that it happens just sort of on accident as well. And it was triggering for a lot of kids who have had traumatic pasts and experiences, um, those loud noises, loud bangs. Mm -hmm. So she, her project for her class was to have soft closed door hinges installed on the classrooms. She met and presented to our buildings and grounds director and a, you know, a, a few other people that were important to be part of that conversation. He was convinced in about five minutes from everything that she said. And they, the, the buildings and grounds um, people spent time this summer replacing hinges on um, doors around that space. And the plan is for that, for those hinges to be used throughout the building. Um, so they have like a whole implementation piece and he's working with her on an article to publish. And um, this is a classroom that had a lot of, I think in the past has had a lot of stigma attached to it, right? Like, oh, that's where kids go when they don't want to learn or they can't learn. And she has changed that narrative completely. And people uh, around the building are like, oh, how, how can we do that? How can we get kids to be that excited to, do you know what I mean? So I think um, as we as we take this opportunity um, from January to the spring to reset our work with World Savvy, I think um, I think it's just I think we're just set up in a really in a really great way. What I love about that too, Cindy, and then Fade, love to have you and KK jump in on this is um, this idea, and we come across this a lot. Where you know I grew up when it was like current events Friday, you know, and like that was the day and the time with Mrs. Smith with the globe earrings where you could talk about the world. And I think, you know, a lot of what we talk about is that this needs to be embedded and integrated sort of as a through line. And and Norwood, you and Alec and, and Margot have managed to do it in a way that it, it then it, disaggregating it from the core of teaching and learning becomes too difficult to do in a way that's really powerful. And I just love the example that you all led at Norwood on that um, to get around that challenge of, oh, it's this separate thing for some people that can be cut out mm -hmm. easily. Um, I love that. Thanks. Um, yeah, Fade, KK, anything you want to add? Yeah. Um, so thank you, Cindy, for once again, for sharing something that is a bit on mine. And I spoke about this at, at, uh, at, an, at an event, actually, at the end of you had a while ago, where a professor of mine told me that um, we all hope for beautiful things for our children, but hope is not a strategy. And City kind of walks you through strategy, right? Like you have to be very intentional about if we want this thing to exist, what are the steps in which we're going to do in order to get there, right? I'm lucky enough to now be a, a leader. So a lot of my end, on my end, what I've been doing, it has been strategically thinking about what books do I want to put in front of my teachers? Uh, what do our coaching sessions look like? How am I helping them change their mindsets toward equity? How am I getting them back to thinking about, for those who have been in the education field for a while, why you became an educator? What was the thing that you want to see for our children? And then from there, being able to kind of bridge that pathway to taking a look at the curriculum and revising it in a way that makes sense. That's why me and my team actually led the revisions of a lot of our curriculum using the HRL framework from Golden Muhammad, right? Um, and then, so I talk about leadership, right? So leadership is one of the big things. Trust as well. If you don't have the trust of your teachers, um, they won't actually open up to you in order to be able to learn. And then if, you are, if you're a teacher leader, if you don't have the trust of your team to take those intellectual risks and have those conversations, going back to that, once again, they won't open up with you, open up to you to have the trust to learn, to collaborate, to then do things in a different pathway 
even if the trust is vertical, right? Trust between teachers to leaders and et cetera. That's one of the things. Because a lot of what is has been the barrier for just folks within this field in general has been, uh, we have standards. These standards mean that are specifically common core state standards for math, social studies, et cetera, um, at ELA. Uh, we have these common core state standards. We want these standards are what we have to teach. And so I'm no longer focused as the standards being something supplementary that kind of guides my thinking, but it, it is the goal. And because it is the goal, I'm teaching our students these very low level skills that don't actually reach into what the purpose of learning is, right? Um, and so those are the, those, those are the two things I say. And the last thing I say, um, something that we tried out this year, uh, which many of you are probably a part of, uh, but in our school, it was the first time ever in its, I believe, 10 year existence that they started was PLCs. Um, once you then have your team established, you then allow them. I don't lead them. I can't lead them. I can't. Right. Um, uh, you have a teacher leader who actually leads the session of collaboration towards either innovation, either towards dismantling what we currently do. Right. Or if it's towards, you know, liberation, empowerment of students. And so what does that look like, uh, whether it be teaching how to be really great writers, really great speakers, uh, really great readers. And you have those sessions where it's honestly like a mini school that's happening with the teachers at school so they can plan to make learning a better space. And the, the teachers are engaged. They're invested. They're built into it. Be, they're, they're bought into it because of the process of, uh, of strategy that I've used as a leader to kind of get them to have the buy in to then almost run the school on their own, run the, the the humanities program on their own. But if you don't have the strategy, we're going to hope all the time and things don't necessarily come out from it. I love that, buddy. I do. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, KK. Can I just say one quick thing, Dana? One thing that both of your comments are demonstrating, which is we talk a lot in World Savvy about how, like, you know, when we look at working within a school or a district, we're, you know, we say like grassroots, grass tops, but you actually have to think about all of the stakeholders within the community and think about how you pull those levers. But you are both such a great example of the kind of leadership that is necessary within a school community because teachers feel afraid in a lot of different ways. Like you don't want to deal with an angry parent. You don't want to feel like, oh my gosh, if my kids don't score on this test, like I'm going to lose my job or not get that raise. Or there's a lot of fear, I think, that teachers feel for all kinds of reasons. And so having school leaders that make them feel like one, give them permission to start making these moves and then also are part of the journey with them. Um, and that's something that you both do so well, so that it feels like the same way that I wanted my students to feel like global competence was a collective journey for us as a group, myself included. That's what school leaders need to do because, and I can just speak, you know, having done workshops in Norwood, sitting there in the room with the teachers is Cindy and Margot and Alec, you know, like they're there, they're part of the learning. And I just... I can't overstate enough how important that is because especially you want to create the systems and the passion and the energy around this work so that if you were to leave and move someplace else that it lives on long after you're there and that just a I just want to make a nod for the incredible example that you both set for the your students and your teachers and your families co-sign all of what KK just shared. And, and the other thing you're both making me think about, and Fada, you leaned into this is, you know, change really does move at the speed of trust. And so if you want to create new kinds of environment, that's, that, that's what you have to build. And, and the actions that you just described on the part of leadership, Cindy and Fada, showing up, being a part of the learning journey, not, you know, like the, that thoughtful and strategic piece is just um, so critical. The, the last thing it made me think about, and we've got a minute left, and so I want to end on this note, and it, it, it answers one of the questions in the comments, too, around, um, you know, approach to professional learning shifted because of COVID is, if you've heard, if you heard KK's session, I'm sure she said this, um, that we think a lot at World Tabby about, you know, school transformation to get to the place where you are is is not about one big strategic move, but about, a, about thousands of small moves that really empower lots of individuals within that ecosystem to be moving forward, particularly as you think about the fact that the average tenure for a superintendent, right, is less than three years in most urban areas, right? And so so both of you have modeled this well, that 
it's not one sweeping strategic plan that says we will now all be globally competent. It's a myriad of ways of igniting the stakeholders within your community to see themselves as entrepreneurs and agents of change in the process. Um, and I just, I, I really think that that's so critical as we're kind of closing this two days of learning around, you know, 20 years in this sector, 21 years in this sector leading World Savvy. And, you know, I think back to we started in the No Child Left Behind era, like just fresh out, you know, after that had been introduced as a framework. And it has moved so much more into a mainstream way of thinking about what quality teaching, learning, um, and culture is within K-12. And that's that we really need to keep the foot on the gas there. And I think I'm inspired, really inspired by both of you and how you've managed to do that, right? Through some really challenging years um, to be in school. So I'm super, you know, we're honored and privileged that you're a part of our network and family at World Savvy and just want to thank all of you um, for spending a Saturday afternoon uh, to close what's been a pretty extraordinary conference. Thanks to Lucy and to Bill and to Juleen um, for, for putting on such an amazing two days of critical conversations about the future of education, really. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. And I think now um, Lucy or Bill may be popping back in, but I know there is. Um, I was in there. Here I am. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. We really, really, really appreciate it and love the conversation. And this was a perfect ending to um, a tremendous 30 hour period of sessions. Um, I'm glad we had the opportunity to, to hear from you and your leadership and, and, and take some uh, notes on, on how to proceed because um, as Julene mentioned in, the, in one of her comments, she's like, your leadership, Cindy and Bade, is really, you need to lead other leaders in that direction. And, um, and so we really, really, really appreciate it. Um, just to, to also say to Dana and the World Savvy team, you guys have been absolutely amazing during this six month period, basically, that we've been planning. I want to give a shout out to Maria, who is in the front of the, of the stage now, as opposed to the back stage. Um, Maria Hersey has been our, our, you know, our liaison and, uh, just phenomenal in helping us, um, put this together. So hooray for Maria. Um, and and I, I hope we can do this again. And we've learned a lot of lessons. I think it's improved since its previous iteration as the Global Education Conference. And it would not have been possible without you, World Savvy. So thank you so much. Um, we should standing ovation for you. And you know, often get it because you're we know how much you're doing with behind the scenes and just really like for you know, for anyone watching along, like, you know. It, it is it's not is about me it's about I mean, it's unbelievable what you what you um what you've contributed to this and, and to keep yeah. it alive and running so, so there, there are a couple more things going on to, to let everybody know um so right after this we're going to have an after party um and taking it global is going to announce their winners of an art contest and we're going to do some kind of fun things going down memory lane also at this around the same about this at the same time maria uh Percy, the director of strategic partnerships for world savvy will be in her booth in the in the world savvy booth and she will also be having kind of a meetup for anyone who wants to talk about global competence more and i don't know if anybody if everybody's exhausted at this point and will show up <laughs> but if you really want to dig into it with maria and um talk about that it, we we had some meetups like this throughout the conference for people just to kind of informally get together and chat so those things will be going on. Then the conference is technically over, but this space will be open. The, 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 and Bill is working on this right now. All of the recordings will be available for till the end of January for, for uh, initially. And this space will be open till I think Sunday morning. So if you want to network and you know poke around and that sort of thing, Everyone is welcome to do that, but there's going to be no more live sessions after our, our um, booth today and our meetup. So um, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on that, and and I'll make an announcement that about that as well. But um, again, thank you so much, everyone, uh, presenters, volunteers, uh, uh, keynoters, uh, partners. You guys have been the best, and let's do it again next year, okay? Yes, thank you, Lucy. Thank, thank you. you. That was awesome. That was amazing. You're a great team. Yep. 
आसन आसन 